Blessings in Jesus and hallelujah, friends. Welcome back to Hayek Ministries, where holiness is a way of life, and Jesus is truly King of kings and Lord of lords. And together, God's people say with grateful hearts, hallelujah. Well, friends, I want to bring to you a topic today on a subject that is upon the minds of many of God's people. On June 28th, in the year of 2015, the United States passed the decision to legalize homosexuality and lesbianism in all the states of America. Now, due to the fact that this would bring much confusion and many questions to the people of God, I preach this message two days later, June 28th of the year 2015, to a local congregation of God's people. There comes a time in every church in which all things must be silenced. Today is that day. All across this great country, pastors are presenting a message such as this to their flocks and warning of the impending doom. As a pastor, I cannot imagine ministering to the many needs and questions of God's people following such events as the bombing of Pearl Harbor, Martin Luther King's assassination, or even most recently the attack on the Twin Towers in New York City. Yet here today I find myself as your pastor in this most monumental moment in U.S. and even world history. I would be shirking my responsibility and neglecting my duty as your pastor if I were to simply avoid this issue and move on as if nothing had happened. Now some of you are aware of what has taken place, but need guidance in how to proceed from here. Some of you are confused by this decision and have many questions. Some of you are not at all phased, having no or little understanding of the actual implications of what this decision means. What took place on Friday will come to be known as the single most tragic event in U.S. history. And according to Bible prophecy, it is the beginning of a series of events that will lead to the eventual collapse of the things that made this country so great to begin with. The United States Supreme Court, the highest court in this land, enforced a nationwide law of same-sex marriage, stating that every state must now perform these marriages or face discrimination charges. Our nation rejecting God's order of marriage is bad enough. But the real issue here runs much deeper below the surface of this decision. Every pastor and every Christian who will not conform to this new law will now be considered a hate monger and bigot and will face criminal charges of discrimination and hate. It is now either put up with them or shut up about them. In actuality, it's much deeper than that. The underlying problem is that we now no longer have freedom to choose who we serve in our businesses, who we allow in our churches and pulpits, who we marry, and who we don't. And this has opened the floodgates for anyone who screams discrimination loud enough to be allowed the same opportunities we now see in the LGBT community. We, Christian Americans, have lost our freedom to speak truth openly and without threat. Many of us who stand for truth, biblical truth, will be brutally persecuted, imprisoned, and even killed. Yes, in this lifetime, most likely within a few short years, maybe even months. They no longer want to hear truth and will do all in their power to eliminate our voices. In short, this is judicial tyranny and the blatant disregard of the U.S. Constitution. This is more monumental than we can imagine, and I am afraid today I will fail most miserably in trying to present to you all of the information you need as we move forward in this unprecedented time in history. In short, our freedom has now been stolen and this is not the same America we lived in one week ago, though it may appear that way on the surface. Many of you may feel this will have no impact on most of us here in America. But think about this for a moment. Once we as a nation have removed all moral guidance from our dictates as a country, anyone who cries discrimination has open rights to have their plea heard. As a country, our moral dictates have always been taken from the Bible, God's word on every matter and issue of life. That is no longer true, and Friday's decision clearly proves that. 
True, we have been watching the erosion of these dictates for many decades now. But Friday's decision has tipped the scale in a way we will not understand until we are sitting alone in a place of torture and despair simply for our love and faith in Jesus Christ. We find ourselves as Christians in this local body facing some very difficult challenges and extremely dark days ahead of us. It is important at such a time as this to pause from our normal routine of service and address this most historical day in this society in which we live. So you can understand the urgency of this message and the reason why I've placed everything on hold to deal with this critical issue. The Bible has predicted it. We are my friends, my brothers and sisters, most definitely in the end of days. We have talked about it. We have preached it. We have warned against it for many years. And now, here we are. So what are we to do? How are we to accept this news? How are we as God's people to conduct ourselves going forward? I will attempt to answer these questions and more in this most timely and critical of messages today by presenting you with much needed information on the topic, facts, and most of all what the Bible says about it. I do not want to make a mountain out of a molehill, yet when viewed through the pages of Scripture, this is a mountain. Some of you have family and friends who are involved in this lifestyle. So my attempt will be to deal with this topic with much sensitivity and as delicately as possible while allowing Scripture to speak with all of its authority and power. This moment is historic for many reasons, most of all because of Bible prophecy. The Bible has long foretold of such a day, a day when God would turn his back on a nation that rejects his people and his truth. This is that day. God has now rejected America. He has done this for two reasons specifically. The first is that America has turned its back on Israel. The Bible says, Blessed are those who bless thee, speaking of Israel, and cursed are those who curse thee. We as a nation are now cursing Israel by turning our backs and no longer supporting her. The second reason is we have decided as a nation to forsake that most sacred of institutes, that being marriage, and desecrate it in a way that is equal to that of Sodom and Gomorrah, and we are all aware of what happened to them. It is especially confusing when we see the biggest names in Christianity today conforming to the world's view and rejecting scripture. Those whose writings have brought us so much joy over the years whose music has lifted our spirits so many times and carried us to heights of joy unspeakable and full of glory. You will begin to see these people choose sides on this issue, and their choices will be the same as that of the world's, full of compromise and abandonment of God's precious holy word. Many, already since Friday's decision, have voiced their opinion and are in direct contradiction with Scripture. You are going to see many whom you admire and hold dear to your hearts compromise the teachings of Scripture for political gain, money, higher success, fame, social acceptance, freedom, and opportunity. Friends, always believe God over man. Man can and will err from truth. God never can and never will. It is time to take your eyes off of spiritual leaders and cast your eyes to Jesus Christ and the teachings found in his word alone. It is time to put down your Christian books and fall at the feet of Jesus and allow him to teach you from his word. It is time to turn off the TV, get off of Facebook, put away the Xbox, set aside your cell phones, and pray as if your life depended upon it, because it does. It is time for each of us to search his word daily for truth while we have our Bibles. It won't be long and they'll be coming for them next. It is time for us as his people to pray for courage, for strength, and for absolute devotion so that when that day comes, and it is surely coming, we will follow in the footsteps of our Lord and so many who have gone before us. It is time to get serious as you never have before. Are you ready to suffer for his cause? Are you ready to die for Jesus? Now, I know what you're thinking, 
Pastor, don't you think you're taking this a little too far? Many of us warned about this day, and many have laughed at us and said we were taking things a little too far. We would never see this day in our lifetime, they said. Yet, here we are. Many of us are again now warning of coming persecution to the saints of God as never before seen in America. And just as I have been warning of this day, I am again warning you loud and clear, persecution and imprisonment and possibly even death are not far off to everyone who takes the name of Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. So prepare yourself. It is coming. Jesus is about to separate the wheat from the chaff. We will find out real soon who the true followers of Jesus are, who the ones are who are really serious about their commitment to Jesus. Persecution has a way of doing that. Ray Carey, a national gay leader for a leading gay organization, said Friday, quote, We will continue to do work in this country to ensure everyone's rights are protected and religion should not be used as a means to discriminate against others, unquote. Do you understand what she is saying here? Can you read between the lines? When she says religion should not be used as a means to discriminate against others, that is exactly what she means. They will attack and defeat any and all who deny any freedom to their cause, regardless of the personal choices of Christians. And they will do so by charging them with discrimination and hate. They want to rid this world of any reminder of consciousness of sin. And that includes Christians, the Bible, churches, pastors, and anything else that holds God's word as the ultimate source of truth. But where is the discrimination on our side? Where is the freedom of choice on our side? There is none. Keep a watchful eye on their hypocrisy. You will see much of it in the coming days and months. They expect no rights for us as we surrender to them, and they gain all of the rights for themselves. Do you see the hypocrisy here? They have made it openly clear they are coming with lawsuits, hate crime charges, and any and all dissent will be silenced. Okay. So what's the big deal anyway? Doesn't everyone have the right to choose how they live their lives? If they choose to live in a gay lifestyle, what's that to us? I mean, science says they are born that way and they have no choice, right? The American Psychiatric Association is governed by a diagnostic manual known as the DSM. This stands for the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. It was initially printed in 1952 and lists and discusses treatment for all mental disorders. But did you know that until the 1980s, homosexuality and lesbianism was a documented mental disorder such as schizophrenia or bipolar disorder? Now the question is this, does 25 years of modern advancement erase 6,000 years of history? Or is there a political agenda that we're not fully aware of? In 1980, there seemed to be an influx of psychiatrists and political figures who were gay that needed to change the written word to appeal and cater to their choice of lifestyle. Due to this, it was half removed from an updated edition in the 80s, making it only a mental disorder if you were unhappy or depressed about being gay. Those changing such things were happy about their choices. It somehow eased their conscience as to the choices that they were making were now okay. The most recent edition has removed any form of mental disorder at all. In the same book, the same is also happening with transgenderism. In the latest edition, it has been updated to say that it is a mental disorder only if you are not at peace about the lifestyle. If transgenderism follows the same path as homosexuality and lesbianism, the next edition will have removed any hint of it being a mental disorder as well. Polygamy, pedophilia, and bestiality will soon follow. 
There is no longer anything to hinder anyone from any lifestyle they choose, certainly not the Bible. If a group screams, we want freedom of choice, and the courts no longer listen, it will be discrimination. Any group seeking freedom of choice, any that is, except we Christians. Also, notice how they change their book over time. This is what they expect of us as Christians, to change or update our Bibles as well. This is yet another step, maybe the final step, in the moral decline of Christian America. You would think history would be our greatest teacher. Do you remember anything significant, historical, that took place in 1973? Roe v. Wade. Our nation legalized the abortion, that's a nice political word for murder, of innocent babies nationwide. We now have over 60 million babies who have been murdered legally, and this does not include those outside of legal practice. 60 million babies aborted since that time. To show you how big a number that is, 60 million days is over 164,000 years. So if one baby was killed a day in America, it would take 164,000 years to reach what we have done in 42 years. Or, to paint a clearer picture, that is twice the population of Texas. So remove everyone from Texas twice and erase that state from our borders, and that is how many lives we have killed. Proms never enjoyed, marriages never seen, college degrees never earned, and lives never lived. And this is only in America. The numbers for a worldwide killing of babies is astronomical. Well, that was the last national rule that directly opposed the Bible that we hold so true and so dear. What good do we honestly believe will come from this national rule? Again, directly opposing the very word of God himself. How many broken lives, shattered dreams, Ruined families and children must we harm before we realize God's way is always the best way. The fall of America, my friends, has begun. Using the same tactics used by gay rights activists, not even 24 hours after this court decision on Friday, pedophiles have now begun to seek similar status, arguing their desire for children is a sexual orientation they were born with, no different than heterosexual or homosexuals. Do you understand the implications of that? And by their definition of what is right and wrong, they are correct. There are no limitations by their definition of what is right and wrong. Critics of the homosexual lifestyle have long claimed that once it became acceptable to identify homosexuality as simply an alternative lifestyle or sexual orientation, Logically, nothing would be off limits. Gay advocates have taken offense at such a position, insisting this would never happen. However, psychiatrists are now beginning to advocate redefining pedophilia in the same way homosexuality was redefined several years ago. The Bible states very clearly that homosexuality is a choice by the very fact of calling it sin. If it is sin, then we can repent of it, and as with any other sin, stop doing it. So it is clearly a choice. But where does the Bible call it sin? In several places in the Old Testament, but let's focus on the New Testament. Turn to Romans chapter 1, and let's look at verses 18 through verses 32. Now in verse 18, notice they hold the truth in unrighteousness, meaning they bend the truth to conform to their lifestyle. They bend the truth. Verse 19, they know the truth. God has planted it in their hearts, but they do not heed to the truth. Verse 20, they have been shown the truth and are without excuse when they stand before God on judgment day. Verse 21, says that they became vain. Now in the Greek, this is the word mateo, and it means wicked, 
and foolish. They became wicked and foolish in their decision making. Their heart was darkened to his truth and their thoughts ran wild with lusts. Verse 25, the truth they changed is the constitution of marriage by God. One man, one woman. They worship themselves by making their own decisions rather than listening to God. Verse 26, vile means disgraceful. Verse 28, reprobate means rejected, no conviction, not convenient. They serve no purpose and they have no positive outcome on society. Verse 29, notice that as with legion, Demons travel in packs. Verse 32, worthy of death means that they are no use to society. They are a plague on society. When it says they have pleasure in them, it means they approve of these decisions. They agree with them. They side with them. Well, now let's take a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 through 11. When it speaks of fornicators here, it's speaking of those having sex but whom are not married. When it speaks of idolaters, it's talking about a covetous person desiring what others have. When it speaks of adulterers, these are those that have sex with anyone other than their married partner. When it speaks of effeminate, it's talking about those who are sexually addicted, pornography, and things like. When it talks about abusers of themselves with mankind, in the Greek, this is the word Asarkinatus, which means one who lies with a male as a female. When it speaks of thieves, it's speaking of those who take what does not belong to them. When it speaks of covetousness, this is one eager to have more. He's never satisfied. And remember, we're told in Psalm chapter 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. When it speaks of drunkards, it is speaking of those who become intoxicated from drinking alcohol. When it speaks of revilers, these are those who complain at fate, those who speak abusively, foul language with contempt toward orders. And when it speaks of extortioners, these are those who are extremely greedy for money and things at all costs. Okay, you say, but Jesus never talked about it. He never preached against it. That argument is insufficient because he never spoke of pedophilia either, but that doesn't make it right or acceptable. But are you sure Jesus did not speak about it? Look at Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. This is the Hebrew word isha, and it is a feminine noun always used of a female. Now look at the same passage recorded in Matthew chapter 19, verse 5, and this is the Greek word, gyne, and it is a feminine noun and always used of a female as well. So we see here Jesus did speak of it by constituting what marriage is and is supposed to remain. So we have clearly seen from Scripture that marriage is between a man and a woman, homosexuality and lesbianism is sin, and anyone practicing this choice of lifestyle will never enter into the kingdom of God. I hope that answers any disputes and questions on this particular topic. But how are we to treat these who make these choices, and are we to welcome them into our local fellowship? Put simply, we are to treat them as we would any other sinner. We love them and tell them the truth of God's word. Notice in our passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 that homosexuality and lesbianism is linked with many other sins. Fornicating, idolatry, adultery, the effeminate or sexually addicted, the thieves, those who are covetous, the drunkards, the revilers, and the extortioners. You see, homosexuality and lesbianism is just simply one of many sins. I want you to be prepared, though. When you tell them God's word, you're going to hear a lot of judge not lest you be judged. So get used to hearing that if you're not already. We must also be prepared to defend against it biblically. And we can and should defend it from a biblical viewpoint. If you tell someone a lie long enough, they will start to believe it.
Judge not, lest you be judged, is one of the most misquoted verses in the Bible. Yet so many believe it as they have heard it so often from their friends, their parents, their grandparents, churches, and yes, even pastors and Sunday school teachers. They begin to believe it as they have heard it and not the way the Bible clearly teaches it. It always helps to read any passage in its entirety so we may see it from its full context in order to understand its true meaning. So let's do just that. Turn to Matthew chapter 7 and verse 1. Now in reading this often misquoted passage, one thing you're going to see is that we are to judge. That is the only way that we can help others. Judge simply means to recognize. And as Bible believers, we recognize by comparing all things to Scripture. Keep in mind also there is an entire book of the Bible called Judges. Jesus taught us to judge righteously in John chapter 7 verse 24. In other words, we are not to be found guilty of the same things we hold others accountable to. We only judge when we've gotten the log out of our own eye, as the text puts it. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 12, it says this, what have I to do to judge them also that are without, outside the fellowship? Do you not judge them that are within, inside the fellowship? And notice verse 13. But them that are without, God judges. Therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. Well, the only way you can do that, friends, is you must first judge them. You must recognize the sin in their lives. It all comes down to this. We cannot fault ducks for quacking. That is what ducks do. Therefore, we cannot fault sinners for sinning. That is what sinners do. But if they claim to be a Christian, a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, and at the same time a practicing homosexual or lesbian, well, I hope you now see from Scripture that is entirely impossible. We must always be clear in holding to the teachings of the Bible. And the Bible clearly teaches that no practicing sinner and those living in this lifestyle are sinners according to the Bible while they practice this lifestyle. They will never enter into the kingdom of God. Now we are not attacking homosexuals or lesbians or transgender people. We are simply holding to the truth of God's holy word and adhering to all the teachings of the Bible. And it attacks sin on every single page. The question is not serving or loving them. It is obvious we are to love them in the fact that we share truth with them. Remember in Proverbs chapter 27 verse 5, it tells us open rebuke is greater than secret love. If we love them, we will tell them the truth, no matter the consequences. And if God so chooses to use us to open their eyes, they will be eternally grateful for it. So if the question is not how we treat them, then what is it? It is, are we to welcome them into our fellowship as believers? What does the Bible say about that? The Bible is clear that we are to draw a bold line between the body of Christ and the world. We have to be very careful that sinners on the outside are not peering in and seeing no difference from themselves inside. We are to be a peculiar people, looking and acting nothing like the world outside. Our fellowship must be a light on a hill, never compromising with darkness in any way. Once we take the name of Jesus Christ, there are specific standards we are to meet and live by. For example, if we see one who claims Jesus sin a sin, then we are to go to them in love, patience, and truth, and show them the error of their way. This includes any and all sin. Now, if they listen, we've won our brother or sister back. If they do not listen nor repent, then we are to take two or more showing them this is not a one-sided opinion. If they still refuse to repent, we are to stand them before the entire fellowship and call them out. If they refuse even after that, then we are to remove them 
from our fellowship. They have proven by their lack of repentance and rebellious heart that they do not belong to the Lord Jesus and that they are not one of us. This is church discipline, friends, and this is the teaching of our Savior, King and Master Jesus Christ, outlined in Matthew chapter 18. The lesson here is once they realize what the Bible says about their sin, in humility and surrender, they will comply to the teachings of the Lord. If they do not, then their heart has not been changed. And that is proven to us by no submission, no humility, no surrender, and no repentance. Therefore, they have no part with us. To be one in fellowship with us, to be one in the Lord Jesus, they must be one, W-O-N, which means they must abandon sin and surrender to Christ along with us. So in closing, the question is as ageless as the topic. Will you follow man or will you follow God? Will you submit to the laws of this government or will you be ruled by a higher government? Even if it costs you your ministry, your friends, your families, and even your life, this is a personal choice that each will be accountable for on the day of judgment. I do not want you to fall into the hands of the living God who has authority over soul and spirit. If we follow the Bible, every letter of it, we cannot go wrong before God. However, when we compromise the Bible to meet or appease our own desires, our very souls are in jeopardy. Allow me to add one final note. The problem here is people don't see sin as God sees sin. We have to be very careful not to make light of sin in any regard with anyone, even ourselves, especially ourselves. And compromising God's word, bending his truth, is a grave sin, maybe the ultimate sin. We also must not justify their sin. Sin separates us from God, whether we are Christians or not. The reason we do not see the power of God in the body today is because we allow too many sins, too many compromises into our lives under the banner of grace. It has gotten to such a point you can't even tell a Christian from any other person in the world. How tragic. There is no accountability to others anymore. Everyone seems to be doing what is right in their own eyes with no absolute moral compass to guide them any longer. Yes, there is grace, but sin still separates and has consequences, even, especially, in the lives of believers. As we minister the gospel of grace, the gospel of Jesus to others, we must sufficiently allow them to see their sin for what it is. As they see their sin, that it has separated them from God, they will then see their need of a Savior. Let me explain, though. The things that we are terming sin are simply the products of sin. Things like drunkenness, gluttony, homosexuality, drug addictions, laziness, sexual promiscuity, pornography, etc., etc. These are all the fruit of sin. Sin, in and of itself, is simply doing what we want to do rather than doing what God wants us to do. Following our own lust and desires rather than what God has commanded us. These are the choices that we make daily. The music we listen to, the movies we watch, the way we spend our time, the thoughts we think, the feelings that we hold on to. These are all the things that offer us choices in listening to ourselves or listening to God. Sin, the very root of sin, is the problem, and that is following our own desires and lusts rather than surrendering all that we have and all that we are to Jesus Christ and following his way. Leaving the lifestyle of homosexuality for those practicing it is no different than leaving the lifestyle of drug addiction or any other sin. Jesus sets us free. We then pick up our cross, leaving those sins forgiven behind, and we press, which means we struggle, 
to become more like Jesus as we leave more of ourselves behind each and every day. That is the salvation experience. That is our command, and that is our victory. The key word, or more precisely title here, is Savior. Jesus came to be our Savior, to set us free from sin. Homosexuality is but one of those sins, but is still sin and rebellion toward Jesus and his word as we have seen today. Yes, we are to love them by rebuking their sin and telling them the truth. But if they have not forsaken their sin, then, according to the Bible, they are not welcome among us, and that includes all practicing sinners. Open rebuke is greater than secret love. As for us as Christians, we should not be praying that God will change America, which seems to be our tendency to do. Let me explain. God had an appointed time down to the day and hour for Jesus to be brutally murdered upon a cross, and no amount of prayer could have stopped it. It is also true that God has preordained the fall of this world, and he has appointed times for the appearance of the Antichrist and the persecution of the saints, down to the day and hour, and again, no amount of prayer will or can stop it. Our prayer always is to be, thy will be done as Jesus taught us. Too many of us have been praying our own wills for far too long. The book of James says we have not, not because we ask not, but because we are asking wrong. We are asking amiss. We are asking our own will and desire, not his. Of course, all of us want America to be healed to become a strong, vibrant nation again. But if it is his will to bring her to her knees, and we pray otherwise, are we not fighting against the very God we claim to love and serve? We need to be asking for courage in these times, strength and devotion to the cause of Christ. Not that he will restore our once great land because many of us will be persecuted, imprisoned, and even killed for standing true to Scripture. America has been blessed for a very long time, yet the Bible promises persecution and suffering. Why do we think we are somehow free from such testing, immune to such suffering? It is time, friends, that we stop praying our will for America and we pray His will be done. Many pray, come Lord Jesus, yet they do not understand the ramifications and consequences of those very prayers. How can we complain when all is being set in order for the return of Jesus, which so many are diligently praying for? You see, these things must happen. So again, I encourage you, the saints of God, to begin to pray, Thy will be done, and to leave your will at the cross where it belongs. Yes, it is time to pray, saints, that His will be done, and we are ready and willing to die for what we love and hold so dear. God's everlasting and eternal truth. God bless each of you as you seek to live out a life for Christ in such an unchristlike world. Well, that brings us to an end today, friends. And it is my prayer that this will help you and guide you as you seek to better understand this controversial topic and that you will not be swayed by the way of this world, but that you will keep God's word first in everything and at all times. Now, as he wills, friends, and until next time, I love you, and I'll see you on the next video.